Welcome to this episode of Keep the Hotel Empty. I'm your host, Eric Paul. In studio today, we are grateful to welcome in realtor, real estate investor, and founder of the Selena G Foundation, Selena G. Bradley. In this episode, Selena takes us back to growing up with all brothers who showed her no mercy, how leaving athletics opened unexpected doors, and how she continues to use her self-discipline and beliefs to find unbridled success at every turn. Please enjoy. Welcome to Keep the Hotel Empty. Today we've kept the hotel empty to welcome in real estate investor and agent and all around incredibly dedicated person, <laughs> Selena G. Welcome, Selena. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How you doing today? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing well. I'm excited to hear about your story. <laughs> I know it's quite an interesting one and for people who are not familiar with you at all, you're actually born and raised in Bradenton, correct? Correct. Yes. Born and raised Manatee County. So take me back to the beginning where you start, because I know it's very different from where you leave. What's what's life like in the beginning, you and your siblings? Oh, so um, I grew up Manatee County, Bradenton, three brothers, only girl, you oh. know, so, <laughs> so, you know, it was tough, uh, tough love all the time. Didn't realize it, but me and my brothers, of course, we fight like siblings, but um, or we fought like siblings. But <laughs> we've always kept a close bond still to t still to today. Are you guys close in age? Um, yes. So um, I have a brother that's three years older than me, one year older, and then one that's five years younger. So. So you're all pretty close then. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what was that like growing up only girl then? What did you get into right away where you start to find out, man, you got this crazy drive? <laughs> um. Well, funny story I could bring up growing up with my brothers. I always wanted to be a boy. <laughs> <laughs> And I never told this, so it's so funny. But, um, you know, I remember being about six years old and wanting to walk around with my shirt off because my brothers always walked around with their shirts off. And right. my mom was like, Selena, you're a girl. You can't, you know, walk around with your shirt off. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was just one thing that, uh, you know, kind of stuck with me, like, especially like in today's age, I always wanted to be just like my brothers. Like we did everything together. So it was just, why can't I be like them, you know? So, yeah, funny story. But just growing up with them, they always n never gave me no mercy. <laughs> it was no mercy. No matter what we did, um, played in sports, basketball was our main thing. When did you start that? How old were you when you started that? Um, I, I can't remember. We were young. We had a basketball goal in, in the yard with grass. <laughs> We didn't have a real court. You know, I grew up, we grew up in a two bedroom, one bath house, six people. Okay. So, <laughs> and my mom still lives there, but it's nice. just her now. But yeah, we grew up with that. And, um, you know, it was, it was just different. You know, I didn't know the difference until I kind of got out in the world and started exploring real estate and things like that. But it was good. I have no like sad stories, you know. No, you know, looking back, I say two bedrooms, one bath, six people. Wow. You know, we made it work. Um, they ended up adding on a little bit when I was nine, got my own room. So and my room was basically a piece of tape. <laughs> like, don't cross the line. This is my room. Right. And they respected it. So just growing up, you know, in that atmosphere with just love, not realizing, you know, the poverty we were in, it was still love. That mentality of making it work without even having to think about it so much every day. Correct. Mm -hmm. So was sports the first thing that you got in that was like structured like that, where there was like a goal at the end, where there was like a win to get? Well, with sports, I played basketball. Um, I played since I was in elementary school. It was always a hobby. It was never like... I'm going to make it in basketball. Okay. For one, I don't think WNBA was out then or close to, it was close to coming out, but I never wanted to make it a career or anything. And I actually went to college for basketball, but um, it was really just basically having fun with my brothers. So it wasn't really like this passion thing. It was more just a fun thing. Yep. <laughs> so when you have your first basketball practice, this is not something that bites you right away. Like, oh my God, I'm this dedicated person. Nope. It was fun. Straight fun. I've always played basketball for fun. I, I never seen it as going to college for it, you know, making a career out of it. 
I always made it fun. Um, unfortunately, when I went to college, it wasn't fun. <laughs> right. So it turned me off from it, actually. So what what what's that moment like? What's it like in college where you're starting to think, hey, this thing that's been fun and been a good vehicle for me is just not not the horse I want to ride? Um, like it it had to do with the coaching. My coach, she was great, but um, just very demanding and wanted me to stand out and be the leader. And I'm always like stand in the background. So uh, it was kind of hard for me to adjust and trying to be, or her wanting me to be the leader. And I'm like, I'm just having fun. Like, is it this serious? And it was for them. Right. So um, it turned me off. I played a year and quit. <laughs> so do you think that she was recognizing something in you that you hadn't yet? Yes, definitely. Definitely. She would always say, Selena, you're not even sweating. <laughs> I'm like, but I'm beating everybody. Like, yeah. what does it? What difference does it make? You know, like we would do like suicides and drills, and she would put me like, if if Selena doesn't win, y'all got to run again. <laughs> and then you have like people who really trying to beat me. You know, like right. y'all making me run hard. It's supposed to be fun, <laughs> you know. But it was just a, a learning lesson. I was 19 at the time. You know, um, just moving out. Going to college, whole different world, not having my parents there with me. You know, it's just a whole different world. So um, I enjoyed it for the time, but then I said, this is not for me at the time. College wasn't. Right. So what is that inner dialogue like when you're really facing, hey, I'm going to leave school and, and head home? Um, I called my mom. And she always brings this story up. I don't even remember. <laughs> but she said, um, I told her mom, I'm coming back home. And she said, why, Selena? I'm like, I don't like it. College isn't for me, but I will still be successful without college. So she was like, after I told her that, she was like, okay. <laughs> so they didn't give me a pushback. So I do remember that. Having both my parents, you know, um, my whole life, they never like went against me in something so serious of making a life decision. So yeah, they were very supportive. So even though you were going to make this unknown 180, you didn't have any crisis of confidence in yourself. <laughs> I did. I, I, I had to have confidence because I told her I'll be successful. I mean, my whole goal, my parents always said, all we want you to do is be able to take care of yourself. You know, if you could take care of yourself, you're good. So I figured I can always take care of myself. So I wasn't nervous, scared or nothing, anything, just Came back home. <laughs> and, and what do you think was the biggest thing that attributed to you having that at such a young age? That's a really difficult thing for people to have even after they've been successful, let alone when they're staring down the barrel of walking away from college. Um, I, I don't know. I, I was just, you know, my, det my determination was kind of finding myself at that time. Like, what do I want to do? Where do I want to go? Um, I had a job, but it, was, it wasn't a career type job. At the time, I said, because my first job when I was 14, they had summer programs and I worked at a daycare. So I loved it. I loved kids. I loved working at a daycare. So when I came back, I worked at a daycare. And um, Did they, you know that before you left or was this a no, le leap in the net appeared leap, thing? Leap in the net, leap in the net. I came back, worked at a daycare. I worked at a um, special needs facility as well. So I kind of um, had the same feeling. Working with special needs um, was kind of like working with kids, same thing mentality they have. So it was it was good for me. Like I loved working at the daycare and I love working with special needs. So it was kind of a trigger for me. I was 23 at the time. And um, that's when I transitioned into owning a daycare. From 24, I had my son working a job and I'm like, I used to work 70 hours a week, 10 hours a day, oh. just to provide. And it was just me and my son at the time. And I'm like, I cannot do this forever. Like, it's no way 10 hours a day I could do this with a child. So I got in a daycare, opened a home daycare. I'm like, I could be with my son every day. So. so what's it like leading up to that transition? It seems to be that you don't have a problem taking <laughs> assessment of your life and saying, you know what, Some, mm -hmm. something's got to give. We got to do something else. My mom says that all the time. She's like, Selena, you always change. But I, when I do change, it's, it's, it is for the better. And um, it stretches out, you know. 
when I came back, I was like, I'm going to do a home daycare. I've seen people do it. I had family members who were doing it, my aunt, my cousins. And I loved kids. I worked in a daycare. So perfect transition. I could be with my son all the time. So it was um, it it was it was a great transition, actually, from my job that I was working. I kind of like I told a friend of mine, which was my brother's friend who was around me. We still you know, all of us still hang out like we were very close. But one of his friends, I, I was just talking. I always share my dreams or aspirations with them. Mm-hmm. And I said, I, I'm going to open a daycare. And he his friend was there. And I said, um, I'm going to open a daycare. I need kids. You know, and he said, I have five kids. I, <laughs> I could only take six. And my son was one. Right. So I only had five spaces left at the time. And he said, I got five kids. I'm going to bring them to your daycare. It was This was literally a Friday. And I said, I'm opening Monday. And he said, I'm going to make sure my wife or girlfriend does what she needs to do so you can do it. So Monday, he called, we called, we set it up. I was full. <laughs> I was like, whoa. And everybody's like, you know, it takes time to get kids, you know, kind of transition into that. But it was an easy transition for me. You know, I had five kids. I was full, couldn't take any more. So I'm like, okay, right path. It seems like a lot of these transitions, and we haven't even got to the big one yet. It <laughs> seems like a lot of these transitions you've taken with incredible grace. Mm-hmm. What do you, what part of your personality do you think allows you to do that? Is it just straight open mindedness, or that you were surrounded by so much love and support? What's the, what's the magic sauce in that? Because like like I said, that's a big hiccup for a lot of people. Yeah. About face gets scary. <laughs> I think um, definitely God's grace. Definitely the love that I grew up with. And I always worry, like, I don't have a sad story. You know, I, I wasn't homeless. You know, I didn't have trouble and, and, and from what I saw, you know, poverty or anything like that. But it was just how I accepted things. And I always accept, accept things for what it's for. And then I move on. So with that situation, I was like, you know what? What, what good can come out of it? I always right. try to look at the good that can come out of it. And the good at that time was spending time with my son. Like, I didn't want to be a mother who worked all the time. My mom worked a lot. Right. And um, my dad was a stay-at-home dad. He got hurt when we were younger. So their roles kind of switch. So I always kind of wanted to be there, you know, with my kids. So. So having that determination to be there for your son, let this path be a little bit, yes, pave its way a little bit Correct. more. Correct. So it seems like it wouldn't matter if you were running a, a kitty spa, things would be going your way. So t- talk to me about when you get off the ground with your daycare full right away. How, how is that feeling? Is, are you feeling like this is it now? I did. I thought I was going to retire. I wanted to be the old grandma with all the kids, <laughs> you know. It was kind of like a housewife. I always wanted to be a housewife, so I'm home with the kids, you know know, cooking, cleaning, feeding them, teaching them. So it was, it was such a great feeling. I did that for 12 years. And um, and you kind of went in the deep end of the pool, right? You weren't just watching kids while mom and dad were at work. Correct, correct. Like when I started 14, being at a daycare facility, it kind of showed me, you know, okay, I know I love doing this. And even before that, I would watch like my cousins, kids, if they go out, I was the babysitter. They would call me and pay me, you know, like $10 to, to keep their kids back then. So it kind of was like a transition that something that I really, really loved doing and I, I didn't see it as work. But you, you watched kids 24 hours a day. Did you do that right out of the gate? Um, not right out the gate. So when I first got into daycare, I, um, I kind of did, you know, like nine to five type hours. And then I started seeing a need for overnight care. And I started, I expanded, I hired an employee, my aunt, she worked with me. I did overnight care. I was at a point I had 24 kids. So what is it in you that, (laughs) what is it in you? What are the feelings like when you see that need and you don't think to yourself, well, someone else can watch them all night. That's a whole nother can of worms. You think to yourself, you know what? I can do that. Yeah. um, No. Yeah. I just felt, I knew they would be in a safe environment uh, and I just have a special heart for kids or anybody. So I said, if I could bring, you know, the caliber of taking care of kids they're in a safe environment. I love it. It doesn't seem like work. 
um, why not continue? Why not expand? Why not? So I was, I was in that field then. Have you ever had the sentiment where something felt like work? Oh, <laughs> sometimes in real estate, I do feel like it's work. But at the end, you know, when you make it to the closing table, it's all worth it. So how long between when you first start out your daycare, you did it for 12 years, that's a fair amount of time. Mm -hmm. How long between the uh, just getting it going to you start expanding and you go to 24 kids, how long does it take you to get from six to 24? That's a hell of a leap. Um, I did. I think I did about four years uh, just by myself. And then I seen the need, like I always had a waiting list. People always want, I'm like, I got to go bigger. I got to go bigger. But I had... I hate depending on other people. Right. So I knew I had to depend on a worker to come help me, you know. So it was then, like, my aunt who had actually, she owned the daycare, but she was kind of downsizing. And she was like, I'll come help you, you know. Perfect. So I was like, okay, I can expand now. And then it, it went to me adding on to my home then. I added on a whole big room with a bathroom, separate entrance from my home. So it was kind of like a big deal. So I added that on, brought my aunt in. We did, you know, 12 kids together. At night, I probably had six kids so I could do that on my own and never slept. But it was it was good. It didn't feel like work. It really didn't feel like work. It seems like you were unbelievably well suited for that. <laughs> so how does that how does that line get to the point where you're like, you know what, now I got to do even more than this? Oh, my son. Again, we go back to him. He was sick. He was really, really sick. He was about six years old. He was in the hospital, all children's for a week. And I just felt overwhelmed that I couldn't be there with him. Cause I had to take care of other kids. Somewhat so, ironic. Yeah, and I'm like, this not this not gonna work for me. So I prayed about it. Like, what can I do to provide for my child and still be there for him, but still be able to, you know, live. And um, it came upon me to go into real estate. I knew nothing about real estate. I bought a house when I was young. I was 23. My parents pushed me. I was 22 at the time. And he was like, you should buy a house. You should buy a house. And I'm like, no, I don't want that responsibility. You know, you hear these things. So I turned 23, lived in an apartment for a year. And I'm like, this is a waste of money. I've seen it right away. So I went back. Parents like, how do I buy a house? What do I do? And my friend, she had bought a house. She was young. And I said, what realtor you use? So I kind of went that route, bought a house, that still, I still was doing a daycare. I was looking at that, but then it came to, you know, me taking care of my son, not being able to be there for him. I'm like, I got to do something. And it was just something that came upon me, say, going to real estate. So I started, I went back to my realtor who helped me purchase my first home. And I said, hey, I'm thinking about going to real estate. Can you help me? You know, show me the ropes, see if this is a route I want to go. And she said, if you're serious, get your license, then come talk to me took key to that six months later got my license and I could say I took the test didn't pass the first time second time or third time it took me four tries passed the test and then I said hey pass the test what do I do next and she kind of like come to my office you know and put me to work <laughs> and I'm like okay so I still had the daycare then I still had um you know, still had a daycare. Then I transitioned into real estate, you know, talking to her. And she was kind of like giving me the real deal. You know, people don't jump off and go into real estate. You right. know, it's going to take time. It may take you a year to get a listing. Like, I don't want your expectations to be high, you know. And I didn't know. You know, I didn't know what to expect. So I said, okay, you know, I'm, I'm all for the challenge. You know, first week, client called me. I want you to sell my house. And I'm like, what? So I called my mm -hmm. I called my broker like, hey, I got somebody who want me to sell it. She was like, are you serious? I'm like, <laughs> yes. First week. They don't know you that well yet. <laughs> first week. So my first um, transaction was I was a listing agent. The sellers, you know, they had already purchased a home, but they just needed a sell. Mm -hmm. And um, they went with me, you know, straight off. They, they grew up around the corner from my parents' house. So they were like, hey, you know, we want you to sell our house two weeks, close, cash deal. And I'm like, wow. 
this is going to work. Wow. Right. So I was like, okay, I think I could do this. Next week after that, um, one of my daycare, because I still was doing the daycare. So I did the daycare full time. And then I went into real estate part time. So I'm still doing the daycare. And um, one of my daycare parents needed to sell their home and buy a home. Oh, nice. So I'm like, okay, easy. You know, we sold the home. No problem. She bought a home. No problem. And again, I'm like, wow, like I can really do this. So at the time, I still was running a full time daycare. And when my kids would go to sleep, like nap time, usually about two hours, I would get on the phones, get on my computer, you know, do my research, just learn more and more about real estate. I remember I was nursing my daughter because I was pregnant when I um, got my license. And then um, I had her, had clients. I was showing houses like my daughter was two days old. I did what I had to do. I was going to say, how many plates can you spin? I don't know. I did what I had to do, and I'm like, that was crazy. I wouldn't. I don't think I would do it again. Like it's well, I'm at a point where I wouldn't have to, but right. But I, I had to do what I had to do, and my daughter was two days old. A client wanted to see a house, didn't want to lose them. Wrapped up December, you know, make sure I'm warm, and when it showed a house, you know, I just really did what I had to do at the time. So you've been building resolve right along. <laughs> I guess you could say that. So it's not hard to see you got a rabbit's foot quality about you, no doubt. Mm-hmm. But you mentioned that you took four tries to pass this test. Mm-hmm. So take me back to what it's like. You build up, you're getting ready to go take this test the first time. What's that day like? Because I know for a lot of people, that's a big thing. Yeah, it was. I took a class. I did in person. I wasn't an online type of person. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I got this. I was always smart in school. You know, school was never hard for me. So I'm like, I got this. And for me to fail, I was like devastated. I was like, I think I cried. I was pregnant. You know, right. <laughs> it was so many emotions, so many emotions I can't even name. So I just kept saying, Selena, just keep keep trying. Like, it got to be a reason. I, I don't even know what it was. I just never gave up on that. And I, I figured this got to be a re- I didn't know then. And I don't know why I kept trying. <laughs> I guess I, I hated being defeated. You know, it was like I'm defeated for something I could learn, you know, and I was always a smart learner. I always had good grades. I loved school. So I think it was more of a men- mentality of, I'm not going to leave with me failing a test. So I kept going at it, pregnant, crying, you know, but I made it through. I made it through. Was this one of the first things that made you figuratively sweat? Um, yes, yes, it was hot. It was a challenge for me. And I'm I'm not used to being challenged. So for me not to pass and first try, second time, third try, you know, it was definitely something like, no, you're not going to conquer me. I'm going to conquer you. So. So was there a part of you that was almost excited to have to be tested like that? Yes, I've learned that now. I'm, I love challenges. Um, when I'm faced with challenges now with selling houses, you know, time frames, it's like, yes, I'm going to make it happen. And I do. I always do. So you make it past the test and you had to take a test to become, to actually be able to be a broker as well, right? Correct. Yes. How long was it in between there? Two years. Um, they make you wait two years. You okay. can't get your broker license until you're a real estate agent for two years. But um, at that time, I passed the broker's test one try. And so I, bl- I blame my pregnancy on. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't tell your daughter that. <laughs> no, I don't. So okay. I don't tell her that. <laughs> but now you've had all of these challenges. You can you can draw on that resolve when you go to take this test. Yes. So is that two-year period? Is there a certain number of transactions you have to be a part of, or you just have to exist for two years? Just have to exist for two years. But, you know, my first year, I did great, you know, at the time. I think I made... Almost 40000 of second income. And I'm like, wow, you know, this is great. And so, um, you know, after the second year, I probably made a little. I always made a little bit more every year. So when I came to my second year, I'm like, I know I'm tired of school. I, have, I got my bachelor's degree, you know, I never really used. 
And then, um, but I knew I was getting tired of school. So I'm like, if I'm going to do it, go ahead and do it now and get it out the way. So I, I went ahead to the broker's um, class, exam, pass. It was good. So when you were starting in real estate, you were still going to school for what? Um, no. When I started in real estate, I had just finished school. Oh, okay. I got my bachelor's degree in business management. So I just kind of had a degree. And I was thinking, my thought was open a daycare facility. And I still want to do that. You know, I still have a heart for that. But open a daycare facility. I wanted to be educated, know how to run a business. So that was the means of my bachelor's degree. But everything changed. Everything changed. So the education was really just to try to expand on what you were already doing. Correct. You weren't thinking, I'm going to get an education and jump ship on the Correct. daycare. Correct. So your son's illness was really what was the catalyst Correct. for you to start going back to the well of your resolve and tenacity. Yes, yes. So my son, you know, just having a child and I, I thought like being there for other kids and then not being able, because he was in the hospital for a week, like five days. And, you know, I could go and come, you know, and I had support, my family, friends, my, my dad, my mom, everybody was there to support me. But, you know, your child wants you. So I'm like, I can't be there. And it, it was it was heartbreaking for me. And, you know, he got over the, the illness. It was something we dealt with for years and he's mm -hmm. doing great now. Awesome. But, you know, at the time it was just like. It was it was heartbreaking for me not to be there, but I'm there for other parents and their kids. So, so when you got to start in real estate, you were able to accomplish that goal of giving yourself some more flexibility and making more of your own time. That part you kind of did expect that was what you wanted to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's some of the stuff that started to happen to you right away that you didn't expect? Um, I mean, I think what I didn't expect was buying, you know, getting clients so, so soon, especially now looking back, I'm like, wow, that was amazing, you know? So I got clients pretty soon, you know, business was doing pretty good and I was balancing both, which I don't know how I did that. <laughs> and I was nursing. Well, practice, it sounds like. <laughs> I was nursing my daughter. I, mean, I think I got a picture and um, my aunt took of me. I'm nursing my daughter, got the computer on the phone, <laughs> like, it was it was crazy. Dinner's being made. <laughs> right. Iron's on. <laughs> <laughs> All of that. So I think just um, just having that determination to be able to be there for them was, well, at the time, my son was like my main goal. Like, I want to be there for him. I don't ever want him to be in the hospital again. I got to leave and take care of other kids and then come back when I'm done. You know, that was just, that was just hard for me. So... Did you find anything odd about, I know, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but from the outsiders, it seems like real estate agent world is, you know, somewhat of a good old boys club and people, you know, got to protect their clients and protect their thing. Did you find anything weird coming into it, being a female, being young, having no experience? No, not really. I didn't know any other realtors like in my world, except for my broker who helped me at the time. So it was new. It was new. It was fresh. Like... I was like, let me find a way to, you know, get this thing rolling. I did it for three years, like I said, part time, but I did so well part time. And I'm like, everybody says if you do it full time, you'll triple your income. So that's all I thought. Like I could triple my income, not do this daycare and still have the flexibility. So I just went out on a limb and said, I'm going to do it full time. Close the daycare. It was it was like hard. It was hard for me to close the daycare because yeah. I really love kids. I still love kids, but it was just something I knew I needed to do for my family if I wanted to, you know, elevate. And it was it wasn't about the money. It was really about spending time. Now I had two kids with my children and not, you know, working all the time. So. And it turns out that time is the most valuable resource. That became obvious to you real quick. Yes. Yep. So you're a single mom at this point? No, I'm married okay. now. Okay. Oh, no, I mean, when, at that point in the story. At that point in the story, no, I wasn't. I was okay. married at the time. Okay. Um, uh, my, I was going to say, how much harder are you going to make this on yourself? <laughs> <laughs> at the time, you know, my ex-husband wasn't, you know, 
I don't want to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, but no, no. Yeah, it, I was, I was, I was, I felt like a single mom. I'll say that. Right. So I knew it was like I got to do something else. I gotta, I gotta move on. I gotta do something else that I've always depended on me. You know, it's hard for me to depend on anyone. Still, like, um, that's just me. I don't want nobody to feel pressured of taking care of me, my kids. You know, it's just. Me and I know I'll make it happen. So, and does that sort of feeling give you that feeling of like Atlas with the stone on his back, or does that sort of feeling give you peace? Um, peace, <laughs> yep, I get peace from it because, like, I know I, I'm not gonna fail no matter what I do, no matter what route I take. Um, I'm gonna make it happen, so I, I do have that confidence in whatever I do. And do you think that that was born of of the sports and that sort of thing, or that's know. just you? I don't know. I, I it had to be just being being raised with love. You know, my parents. I was naive to the world because my parents had such a great relationship. Mm. They never argue in front of us. You know, we never seen that. And um, just having that support and love from both parents. What I think really molded me to to making me think like whatever you want to do. My father always told me he's he's no longer here, but my father always told me, Selena, you can be whatever you want to be. Dream whatever dream you want to dream. And I didn't get it at the time, but now I do. So. So you've always had that license to succeed, as yes. it were. Yes. Yeah. And even though my father, like he was home, he wasn't, you know, this successful you know, type of business person. He always had a love for people. Like, I would tell him, he loved to fish. You know, I would say, sell the fish. And he'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, he he wouldn't. He, he'd probably sell a little here and there, but I'm like, dad, you could, like, really make money of selling fish because he was a great fisherman, but... He wouldn't do it. So he would he would more like give it to people, you know, who needs it, give them a great deal, whatever it is to that extent. So that's how my dad was. So I think I got a little bit of my mom because she was a hard worker. My dad, he was a giver, you know, so I think I got a little mix of both. And that's kind of what created me. Yeah, I was going to say, you definitely seem like you got a very good combination <laughs> of that working for you. So you make it out of the first couple of years, you get your broker license, but you don't become a broker Mm-mm. right away? Nope. Or nope, not, not yet. to this point? Yeah. Okay, so between taking it to that step and where we're at now, how did things start to snowball for you? Um, so I would say I end up closing a daycare, going into real estate full time, and then... Um, as soon as I went into real estate full time, it was like a trickle effect. I didn't have anything under contract. It was really just me like trying to hustle. So as soon as I closed the daycare, within two weeks, I remember I had five contracts. Like I'm like, oh, this is the way it go. You know, they say if you do it at full time, you'll, you know, triple your money. So I was like, let me do this full time. So I kind of Went into it full time, full force head. And the hardest thing for me was um, my social media. I didn't want to think, I didn't want people to think that I was like boasting about right. sales. Like I'm I'm still, I still struggle with that. But um, I realized it helps and it encourages and inspires people. So Absolutely. So I have to keep telling myself that still to this day, post it, post it. It's good. It's going to help someone. And that's how I keep going. It's going to help someone because I never want it to be all about me. So, Yeah, that's the thing. So how do you how do you keep that humble nature? Because it's hard to say, <laughs> look, at, I'm, I'm kicking ass out here on all fronts, but it's not about me. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just, it's nothing that's taught. It's nothing that's, you know, I, I think it's, I don't know. Especially it's, since social media is really a lot the opposite. It's a, it's a lot of people's highlight reels where they're trying to do what is. you're trying not to do. Exactly. And I, I guess that's what it is. Because I, I still struggle with posting success because I don't want to come off as boasting or arrogant or because it's far from what I think. But um, I keep telling myself this is going to encourage someone. This is going to help someone become a future homeowner. This is going to help someone become a realtor. You know, build generational wealth. So that I, I gotta think of the positive that it's going to do instead of 
drowning myself with the negative that it can do. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one should outweigh the other. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what is that like? Where are you at in your in your journey when it's your success is starting to hit you to the point where you're like, oh, okay, now this is actually a little bit bigger than I thought. We we went bigger than six kids. We went bigger than twenty four (laughs) kids. So um I think like the journey is it's more of just accepting it. Like accept accept what's given to you. Keep going, keep shining, keep showing people. I think my main thing is just being relatable, you know, let sure. people know. I was born and raised here. My parents, my mom still lives in the same house. She had an option to move, you know. I, I offered to get her a house and she don't want to go. So that's fine, you know. Like, I don't know. My mom's so humble, too. She worked at Tropicana for 36 years. So I saw that in her, like the, the determination in her to make sure she provides for her family. So I think that rubbed off on me. And well, clearly. <laughs> so it's just kind of like, it's just in her nature. Yeah, so it kind of came within my nature, too. So what's the road from you're incredibly determined, you're incredibly relatable, you're good at whatever you put your mind to, even if you got to fail three times to get there, that (laughs) seems to make zero difference. How does that get to the point where you're starting to do these bigger properties and you're starting to be on the map a little bit? Because I know the realtor market around here, I mean, there's what, 9,000 of you in the couple counties? It is. It's over 9,000 realtors in Manatee and Sarasota County. Yeah, it's wild. It is. It's crazy. Is there a factory? They're just running them out like a Play-Doh thing going? Oh, no, no, I'm like, how oh, these people pass the test? Like, right. <laughs> that's my thought. So how do you start to get into these bigger properties in these other areas when there's literally 8,999 other of you? <laughs> uh, I think really just um, sharing the success, it really helps. You know, my social media, being consistent. That's the main thing. You have to be consistent. And I learned that with anything you do, you got to be consistent. Don't just, you know, show up one day and then go on for a month. You know, every day. It's an everyday fight. It's an everyday follow-up. It's an everyday reaching out. I mean, I I have people, you know, reach out to me too, which is great. I built that to that extent. Mm -hmm. But I still got to respond. I still got to call them back. I still have to follow up. So being consistent is the main thing I say that gets me gets you to the next level and um people see that sharing it on my social media they see that they see what i do and what i do is genuine it's real it's i can't make this stuff up like i'm like you know it's really it's really what happens and i think people really see the genuine in me the authenticity in me that keeps people coming to me so how do you go from houses to, to Mixon Farms? So with Mixon. Because oh. for those that don't know, Mixon is a, a big uh, orchard here. It's Correct. been a staple culturally here for a long, long 84 time. 84 years. Yeah, long, longer than a long, long time. <laughs> Dang, your Star Wars time. Uh, and they recently sold that property and they commissioned you to to be the, the handler of that. How does that come to pass? So how this happened. Again, I think I was determined. I had a friend that worked for them. So I said, hey, she told me, I helped her buy a house. And she told me, hey, my boss, they, they, they want to sell their house. And I was like, get me in. Get me an interview. Don't sell me. Don't try to, like, say she's great. Just, just get, get me in the room. Just get me in the room. <laughs> and so she put them on the spot. We were on the phone, me and my friend. And she said, hey, my friend's a realtor. You know, she wants to interview with you guys to sell <laughs> your personal property. Right. So at that time, um, you know, I think you can't say no. <laughs> you know, you're on the spot. Yeah, I was going to say on the spot. Yeah, it's just an interview. It's just an interview because they, from my understanding, they already had a realtor. But I'm like, get me in. They, they didn't sign any paperwork. So they agree. Okay, we'll give your friend a try. So I interviewed with them to sell their personal property out on Anna Maria Island. Mm-hmm. And I think it went great. You know, of course, they picked me to be their realtor. And we just... Of course. <laughs> we just kept that relationship. We kept that relationship. And one thing um, Mrs. Mixon told me, Janet told me that um, you don't know a good realtor till you work with one. Hmm. And you've exceeded our expectations. 
that stuck with me. And that was with their personal property. So then a couple years later, they got to sell the business. And I'm like, hey, it was in a paper. Like, we kept in touch, but she didn't tell me this. I'm like, you, it's in a paper. You're selling. You know, what's going on? And she said, you know, a realtor came to us. They already had a contract. And they had signed the contract. But she told me, if it doesn't work out, we're going to use you. Oh. So... I was like, okay, you know, and so I kind of still kept in touch. It was maybe a month later she called me. Hey, I don't think this is going to work out. And I said, okay, keep me posted. You know, I'm here. If you have questions, I can help you through it. And she called me back two weeks later. I don't think it was two weeks. It was like two days later because I think she knew. And she Mm. said, it's not going to work out. So what do we need to do? What's our next step? And that's when I came in. So was your uh, experience selling their personal property the first you had done out on the islands and stuff like that? Or were you already starting to do more higher end homes? I was already starting to do more higher end homes. Um, And they were one of my, um, not first, but one of my beginning of luxury properties, a million and over at the time. And this was before the market had jumped. So, you know, um, big properties like that. So I joined a team. I was with my small brokerage for five years and I knew it was more. I'm like, how are people selling like millions and millions? Right. And I'm not there yet. Like, what do I need to do? So I knew I had to grow some type of way. So I joined a team, COA Banker, and then I started to see, like, okay, now I see a different route with luxury properties. I still had my sphere of influence with, you know, more lower end, but I started getting more into the luxury field there. And I'm like, I could do this. It's all the same. It's all the same. Like, and I try to... Tell people, even realtors now, if you're looking in luxury property or like just be yourself, it's all the same. They they want you, not the company, not the colleagues. They want you. They want you to represent them. So I learned that pretty well. I joined a team. I was on that team for about three and a half years. And then I said, you know what? I could do this on my own. So started kind of reaching out, doing my own thing and... I am here I am today. So when you first walk into this million dollar plus property, the very first one that you've got listed, is mm-hmm. it intimidating or is this just sheer excitement at this point? Um, both. It was so intimidating. My first million dollar property that I sold was out in um, Venice. Beach property. Before the spike, it was like $2 million. And I'm like, wow, you know, right. I can I can sell this. You know, I can do this. And I realized everybody the same. Every People are the same. No matter, you're just adding a zero or subtracting a zero, but it's still the same conversations. It's, it's still the same representation. Like, they just see what you do and they want you. And that reality hit you right away? It hit me. Not right away. I still struggle with it. Right. <laughs> but but I, I have learned to accept it. Like, people are people. And I think that's where a lot of people get things mixed up. Um, even looking like in a celebrity field or, you know, just growing up around just what we call normal people. People are people. Right. It's no different. Like, we add the zeros in our minds, but they don't. You know, they're still normal people, so. True. So when you got to the crossroads now where it's getting presented to you that the opportunity to sell Mixon is going to be there, this is a notch up even from that, correct? Yes, definitely. A whole notch. And But I knew people are people. So we had a great, we have a great relationship. We talk. We, it's not so zeroed in and dotting up. I used to think like, I got to be perfect. I got to be perfect. Right. And I got away from that. And I said, just be you. They love you. So once I realized that it, it made me easier, even with um, my husband, he used to tell me, Selena, you're switching your voice. Like be yourself. Like you're more authentic. Be yourself. So I started like listening to that too. Like, let me just be myself. Like, it's hard. It's sometimes it's hard. I'm sure. Like I said, switching me was a big thing of my voice. Like, 
oh, hi, you know. <laughs> yeah, people subconsciously do stuff like that. And yeah. They never, it's hard to realize. Yeah, and then I realized I'm thinking more of talking or how I talk or how I sound compared to just being myself. So that just helped me out a lot. So my husband's very uh, uh, inspiration to me even now. He awesome. He's amazing. He pushes me. I mean, and not intentionally. He just gives me feedback, and I, I listen to him, and so it helps me. Well, that's a good teammate, right? Yep. <laughs> so was this your first time dealing with commercial clients as well as numbers that big? Um, That big, yes. I sold a church back, you know, times change, so numbers have changed. But I've sold a um, commercial church, you know, before at the time. It was still under a million dollars, you know, mm -hmm. but um, for me to get something at this caliber was definitely like, wow, oh, wow. And before that, my husband said, you don't seem excited about real estate how you used to be. He said, you got to get a $10 million property. <laughs> <laughs> Careful what you wish for. Right. And I said, you think so? And I'm telling you, it was like a couple months later, $15 million, so, yeah. So you've been speaking of change. You've been around here your whole life. You've seen it all, and it is change that forced Mixon to to shift away from running that business. Mm -hmm. What are some of the big changes you've seen around here? Oh, uh, definitely Lakewood Ranch. That's the biggest change. Like seeing that community before. I grew up off of State Road sixty four. Um, and we wouldn't go past 75 because it was nothing out there. Yeah, right. So to see like the change in real estate, the change in numbers, you know, just everything. I'm still amazed. I was riding through um, Bradenton yesterday and I'm like, I remember this used to be nothing or cows. And just to see it, it just always brings me into uh, remembrance of what it used to be and what it is now. And, you know, things are always evolving. So I look at myself as that way, too. And the mix in property, what, what becomes of it? It's so, been sold for how long now? Um, so we still, we still have it on the market. Um, I can't okay. say too much about it. Gotcha. But I can say it's going to be sold. Um, it's yeah. just working out the logistics behind the scenes. These are things I'm learning, you know, how things need to be done. Um because there's just no spots of land that big around anymore. Correct. I mean, it's some spots. Like, I have a client who told me if I sell mixed since they got something for me. <laughs> so I'm like, I got it sold, but you'll see, you right. know. Uh, so I, I kind of they, they got about 25 acres on water. So I'm like... I'm, I'm ready to... That's to, even more rare. Exactly. So I'm like, this is a big property. I got... I built my database... I have, you know, Rolodex. I can call some some people. I can, you know, and all of them stay in contact with me. Let me know if you got something else coming up. So it, it's just a change of a mindset that that get, that has me here and that's going to keep me going. So I'm just looking forward to doing more and more big properties like that. Yeah, and we live in sort of a unique place in this this area of the Gulf Coast here. There's mm -hmm. just no real estate like this anywhere in the country, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and before you had mentioned renting versus owning and your experience with it, and I know we're in a kind of a weird spot now with that here. What do you think about the landscape of renting versus owning now? Um, I would definitely, I always go for owning versus renting because you can't control the rental market. Clients that I'm helping now, um, you know, getting four, five, six, eight hundred dollar rent increase. And I say if you own, you wouldn't have to worry about that. You know, even if it's it, it it's definitely a a different market. But I always encourage people to to purchase because you're looking at if you're renting, you're just paying somebody else's rent. It is what it is. You're paying somebody else's rent. They control it. You have no control over that. None. They can go up however much they want to go up. But if you own, you have control over that. You can kind of um, sustain, you know, what's to come compared to not knowing what's to come. Or even because, you know, I manage, I own properties, too, that I manage. And right. it comes to a point where you might want to sell. You know, if they want to sell, where are you going to go? If you own, you don't have to worry about that. 
So I always encourage to be an owner. How much of a challenge or, or pushback has it become now with the variables of the homeowner's insurance situation around here? Oh, it's, it's definitely... I I haven't been hit to the point where this is ridiculous. So that's a great thing for me. Um, all my insurance providers are pretty pretty good. I haven't had a crazy increase to where like I need to sell, but it's definitely a thought in the back of my head, like you know that can come up anytime. Right, and that's something I don't have control over. Exactly, that was gonna. That's kind of my question because in the homeowner world, what we kind of got a, I shouldn't say a unique to, but we definitely got the deep end of the pool here in Florida is homeowners insurance. They crank all the time. They just squeeze you till you have to replace your roof or whatever happens. Mm -hmm. And property tax here is always going up. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you combat those notions when you're propositioning? the the owning versus renting thing it just always evens itself out or it's just a matter of you're building an asset or what's what's the be all end all um my thing is like you said building that asset so once once you know um you start kind of making money or funds on uh, i look at it as it's better to place money in a home instead of a bank mm. cuz you get in you know more interest you know banks they're paying more, a little bit more than what they used to pay now. But Still not enough to make much of a difference. Correct, correct. And um, I've taught, I have friends that's financial advisors. You know, I try to get input from them, and they're like, Selene, you're doing everything right. Like, mm -hmm. I can't even give you advice. Like, I need to take some of your advice. <laughs> so, so um, I think just, you know, just keeping that mindset of, like, I, I don't want to, like, hold on to funds, which I do, but I look at it as putting it into real estate. Like, it's more safer there, and it's, you're going to grow more um, equity or, or, or interest in a home instead of putting it in a bank, you know. So I just look at it in that sense of growing interest, growing, um, you know, my asset to that point of, receiving money instead of paying out or not making much at all, you know, from, from a bank. So this is what led you into managing properties? Correct. Right now, I typically, I'm just manage the properties that I own, but I've opened, I've slightly opened up a property management company. Um, we haven't like expanded to that point. I got so much going on, right. but I look into, um, you know, managing, being a property manager for, for other people who own properties and um, condos or apartments, whatever it is that they need managed, that's why I look. I look for growing that. Is that something you could see yourself doing, expanding in your own? Like, would you like to own like an apartment building Correct. or a multi-unit facility? That is my dream. So y'all hear it now. That's my dream. I want to own an apartment building, and I want it to be affordable. I do. I want to. I still want to help affordable housing. I see the background. I see what's going on. People don't see. It's really, really a tough task. But, right. but I, I want to own my my next goal is to own um, multi units, not just a duplex, but something more of you know apartment complex where. It's enough to um, help affordable housing, help a lot of people, you know, that I've gr grown up with, the, the city that I've grown in. Like, I just have a heart for that. Like, I love my kids, too, but I have a heart for, for real estate and people having a roof over their head. That's very admirable. I can, I can feel that coming from mm -hmm. you. Um, but this is one thing I wanted to ask about the rental market. I know that um, there's some big investors on the West Coast that are building properties and they're kind of reverse engineering the rent so they're only charging marginally above what it takes to maintain the facility mm -hmm. to provide more affordable housing. But then you see a lot of rent that's just kind of solely market-based. How do you how do you walk the line between that one? It, it's kind of hard because... For me, being a, a landlord and seeing both sides of it, like um, I had a property went up seven hundred dollars a month for insurance and taxes, right? And I went up four hundred dollars for like I couldn't even pull myself to go up seven hundred dollars, so I'm taking a loss in that sense. But um, that's just me, like I. I know it's hard for a lot of people. And if I can make it, you know, with just increasing it a little bit, which some 
it's a lot, you know, but I, I see both sides of it. So it's kind of hard to, to judge. And I hear people, oh, landlords are being greedy. That's the thing. And that, that's really kind of the nature of my question, because we live in a spot where the greed is the lowest hanging fruit. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're getting taxed. It's easy to hand the tax on. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got rents around here that are for buildings that are paid for. These people are just literally raking in the money. Mm-hmm. How, you know, how I, do you how do you resist? I guess I, I don't need to ask this, but I'm going to. Okay. How, how do you resist the urge to just say, no, nah, it's your 700? Um, I think it's just knowing the people and just having a heart. Like, I know their income didn't increase $700 a month. Right. Like, it's people, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like I'm comfortable. You know, I can do it at this point. Um, I could take the loss, even if it's, you know, a couple of years, you know, it may ease up a couple hundred, a couple of years, but I just have a heart for people in that, that want to live. And, you know, I, I don't think I need a lot. So the, the capitalist portion of this is really not what's fueling your fire. Correct. Correct. I can say that it's not, it's, it's really just making sure someone has somewhere to stay. You know, I've been born and raised here. I know a lot of people, I have a big family, my mom's side, my dad's side, everybody's here. Um, I help my family out a lot. You know, I try to try to teach them as well, but you know, sometimes they don't get it, but it's all, it's all good. Yeah. Well, well, we're living and learning all at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you've had all of these things that you've been able to be successful at. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you think the next round is? Is it going to be apartment and a daycare? Where, where, what's, what's keeping you fueled at this point? Right now, it's really apartments. Like I want to provide affordable housing. Um, I'm on affordable housing committee. I'm on a couple of committees that you know help with that. And I see the numbers. I see the background. I see the homelessness that right. people don't see, and they think, oh, we're just living. It's bad. It's really bad. So I want to be able to provide um, housing for people. Just to have a roof over your head is a blessing. So I want to be a blessing to other people. That's what made me come up with my foundation. I don't know that, if you heard of that. That's what I was just going to say. And you've <laughs> recently started the Selena G Foundation, right? Yes. Talk yes. to me about that. Tell me. Tell me. So this, middle <laughs> this has been in the works for years. And um, I've always came to a point where um, I was trying to launch it. I was trying to get websites. I was trying to get funding. Just everything that comes with on a foundation just wasn't working out for me. And again, I didn't realize it, but I'm talking about it now that I just wouldn't give up on it. So finally, I got to the point where I, I've launched it. You know, we're starting to get donations, you know, and I just want to be there for the people so they can learn. It's all about learning, education, knowledge. The best thing is knowledge. So I want to be that knowledgeable resource for, for everyone. So with the foundation, you know, um, I look to helping people with who's purchasing a home, who's you know, may need a little help, not a lot, appraisal fees, um, inspection fees, surveys, you know, something to that extent. And also um, scholarships to help people become in the field, whether they want to be a realtor, an inspector, an appraiser, a plumber, electrician, like those are my dreams for my foundation to just build around what we have, um, offer resources to people who want to be an inspector or don't know, but offer that so they can see this is great in our field or who wants to be an appraiser or a carpenter or anything in real estate is, is, is a good field to go into. So I want to just offer that, be able to um, do that. And one thing I haven't said out loud, <laughs> um, next year, school year, I want to be able to, my goal is to get with, um, like maybe Chrome books and give out a thousand laptops for for, for school age students. I want to do high school, middle school, and elementary because like it's digital. It's a digital world, and everybody doesn't have access to that. Right. I see it. Like, we found that out in the pandemic too. Yeah, people do not have access to those things. So my goal is next year. I'm gonna have a back to school drive. I'm not doing backpacks. I'm doing Chromebooks. Yeah. There you go. Because <laughs> it wouldn't be a Selena uh, endeavor if you didn't kick it up a notch. Right. <laughs>
Well, I'm I'm so stoked to have met you. Mm-hmm. I very much appreciate you taking your time to come down. Yes. Your story is very much inspirational, Thank and you. I definitely want to have you back when the brokerage is open, when the apartment is open, when the daycare is okay. open, and when the Selena G Foundation is doing anything that they want to promote. We're, we're definitely on it with you. Yes. Thank you. Thank so, you. I appreciate your time so much, yes. Selena. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. <laughs>